You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40-plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Hey, welcome back to 40 Fit Radio and welcome back to the 40 Fit Nation. I'm here with Coach Trent. That's me. And Coach D. And we're going to talk today about the press, the second of the compound lifts that we're going to be covering over this four or five podcast series on the compound lifts. We've already talked in generalities about the compound lifts on the first podcast. And then we covered the squat. That was two podcasts ago, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we covered the squat last podcast. And then we're going to cover the press today. And then we're also going to cover the deadlift and what we consider kind of an accessory lift, but it's a real, it's one of the big lifts, and that's the bench press. And so we'll be covering those things in this series, but I first have a rant. I have a rant for the day. We need a thing right there that says- Get out your coffee cups. We need a thing right there that goes, rant, 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 for the day, 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 day. We need a thing like that. When I say something like that- sound effects. Or when we do air quotes. Yeah. Air, air, air. No, I'm just joking. I don't know. That's so stupid, but- I mean, hey, it's it's the radio voice. You know, it's the radio thing. I'm trying to make it exciting for people yeah. to want to listen to us just basically talk about nothing <laughs> on a regular basis. I think that you should perform all of the echoes. Yes. So instead of using an effect, just like make it, yeah, it's got to get <laughs> yeah. like, softer. Softer. Yeah, softer. Yeah, you know the TV <laughs> show where the guy says something under his breath? What is it? What's the TV show where the middle, I think, where the, the younger kid in the household he says, he'll say something like, yeah, I got to go to school. To school. He says under his breath right <laughs> afterwards. It's kind of creepy, but I mean, it, it's it's funny. See, I'm, I'm a hipster and I don't watch yeah. television made after 1996. Yeah. There you have it. Well, this the middle is basically designed to be a show that was done back in the 80s. Okay. See? Yeah. So it's, it's 80s perfect. nostalgia. It's yeah. like Stranger Things. Yeah. yeah. It's basically yeah, exactly. straight it's out of the 80s. retro yeah. TV, brother. Yeah. For all you people who think What's retro old is TV new. is new, I mean, I grew again. up on the stuff. So, you know, when 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 classic rock is now the genre that you listen to in the seventies and eighties. Now, classic rock is really like late sixties and seventies, according to me. Yeah, like the Eagles, you know, stuff like that. You know, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To me, that's classic rock. Yes, you know, Aeros- yeah. Aerosmith. ACDC. Is not- Aerosmith's no. classic rock. Yeah, seventies. They, they're, they're kind of. They, yeah, they're yeah. kind of. Rocks in, in, came out and said it. That's the 70s, true. The, yeah. the, the tail end of it. But um, when you start talking about bands like Van Halen, that's not classic rock. Ooh, see, well, all right, so I'm going to blow your mind. Even though I love Van Halen. I'm going to blow your mind. Yeah. Uh, the time period between the breakup of the Beatles and Nirvana is less than the time period between Nirvana and today. Yeah. So, yeah. so in other words, Nirvana They're is... closer than we think. Nirvana is older to us today. Yes than the Beatles were to them when they came yeah. out. Sure. Yeah, sure. so Nirvana is classic rock. What you're talking eh. about that we used to call classic rock is oldies now. Well, yeah, I know. It is. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah. like, so I remember when... Uh, classic rock would be things like Bob Seger. Well, Bob Seger's almost a little... Just he was kind of like a... It. Yeah, he was kind of like a rebirth of classic rock. He's right, kind of like exactly. George Thorogood, you know? Exactly. It's like kind of bringing it back. Um, no, I think that... Cause, so here's how I know. Um when Clear Channel started taking over all of uh-huh. the and all the the radio stations started yeah. merging, yeah. you know, and now I don't even know what it is now, iHeartRadio or whatever. But when that started happening in the early two thousands, the radios were playing the rock radios were playing the exact same set list that they play today. Yeah, they'll they'll rotate in five to ten new songs right, right, that, right, that the right, label's right. pushing, you right, know, at the moment. Right. Sure, but the otherwise I'm hearing the exact same standards, songs standards I heard classical standards. twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't yeah. changed. No, it's really cool though. This is a great crowd to talk to about this too, because this is this is our music. Yeah, man. If you're if you're in your yeah forties ish to f- early fifties, or even in you know just through your fifties, then then that's kind of your era of music is the seventies and early eighties and or mid eighties and nineties really. Yeah, early nineties, yeah, late eighties, yeah, alternative is college. Thing. I mean, yeah, nineties is almost out of college for me. So right. I mean, I've been out of college over th- uh, well in December. Next month, I'll be out of college 30 years, dude. Ooh. Yeah. 
I've been out of high school 35 the years. The world has turned. Yes, a couple Since times. Since then. A couple times. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, what, you know, this really doesn't matter anything, whether it's fun to talk about, a little nostalgia there. But, so my rant, 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 rant. today, uh, that's a terrible echo, but it's fun. My rant today is about the fact that I'm seeing out in like social media channels and different different groups of strength coaches and stuff that we're talking about balance. You know, the idea that when we have clients who come to us and want to do strength training at some point, and I don't know how many podcasts we've covered on this um, because it's just kind of been the bedrock of what we think of as well-rounded fitness for the over 40 population. And that is a balance of the 10 general physical skills. And that is a balance of body composition. And that is a balance of, of good health and fitness and then using that fitness for something outside of the, the walls of the gym, the four walls of the gym. And so we've talked about this a lot in our podcast because it's kind of the foundation of who we are as coaches and what we want to bring to the 40 plus population. And that is this, that, that your health and fitness program should be balanced unless you have a particular desire and drive to want to be a strength competitor or like an Olympic lifter or, or a barbell or a or, or you want to you want to go into weightlifting or something like uh, um, powerlifting, you know, or something like that. Yeah. And so, but generally speaking, most clients come to us. They spend somewhere between six months to a year getting reasonably strong. Sometimes longer, sometimes a little shorter, based on where they are in their athletic development, lifter development, and what kind of genetics they have, and how hard they work, and what the programming has to look like along the way. We know we always start with the novice program when we progress from novice to intermediate to advanced programming. But with all those things being said, at some point, they come to us and they say, what else? Mm. What else? Indeed. What else? Because humans get bored. Am I strong enough? Yes. How strong is strong enough? Wow. We have a podcast about that. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I think there does come a time where you as a coach need to recognize that what may flip your switch or turn you on as a coach might not be the normal population. You know, if you're a barbell geek and you love to read this stuff, study this stuff, watch videos on it in your spare time and uh, listen to audio books, which I'm listening to one right now. And uh, that's on strength. Then you, you're probably, you may not necessarily represent the normal population. Yeah. And so you as a coach need to be able to morph into that coach that can not only provide them with the most important thing, which is a strength foundation, but also be able to condition them, maybe do some accessory lifts, maybe do some hypertrophy work. Okay. Build a little bit more shape, a little bit more muscle mass, create a little bit more aesthetics. I still believe that people do this most of all to look good naked. Right. I know that we talked about that, but I, I really do think that is the case. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that it's important that we recognize all those things as coaches and that coaches have the ability to do a little bit of everything. They need to be really, really good at coaching the barbell lifts. And then they need to be reasonably good and um, skilled at coaching other areas of conditioning and mobility and other areas. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of this comes down to consistency. And there's a couple of pieces of this. We've, talked, we've said that many times that consistency trumps everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Really. I mean, you know, if, if you don't, if you only show up to the gym twice a week on average, it doesn't really matter what your program is because, you know, just showing up every time and not missing workouts yeah. um, over the long term is going to get you results, even with a, a program that's not that great. Right. You right. know what I mean? Right. Um, but I think part of it is keeping the, the lifter engaged long term. You know, as a coach, you need to be able to be flexible when they're feeling mentally beat up. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's not the, from a programming, like logical perspective, even if it's not the right move to make. Right. Sometimes right. you got to deload. Sometimes you got to go move some dumbbells around. Right. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that if that keeps that client coming back for the next six months as opposed to burning out and then laying off altogether. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes we get so rote in the science and in the methodology portion of what we do that we forget that these are humans that they're not machines and that, and that they want creativity sometimes and they get bored just like we do. We need to break. Sometimes our clients need to break, you know, and that's just how it is. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, they look in the mirror and they say, I want to look a little bit better too. Right. So I want to drop some body fat and I want to, I want to keep my lean mass high though. Yeah. So, now that's so a tricky that one though. Yeah, That's a tricky is. one. It's and really here's, hard. and here's why I think, I think 
and, and as coaches, we have some responsibility to set expectations here. But, you know, look, if you're 45 and you've spent the last 25 years at a desk and you haven't been paying attention to your nutrition and your right, fitness right. and you're starting and you're a year in and you've, you've, you've done all the strength work, you can't expect to have a ripped body. You know, it's not a one year process. It's maybe a two, three, no, four but you're year gonna process. You're going to look a lot different. You're going to look a lot better. better. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. But I think sometimes clients have an unrealistic expectation of what their, sure. what their body can look like. And we all know, we've mentioned it before, the media gr- oh, yeah. greatly yeah, skews everything. Yeah. Greatly skews our perception of what's possible physically in terms of physique. But I think also there's, there's kind of like a, there's, there's a middle ground that both the coach and the client have to meet. Yeah. You know, there's absolutely some things you can do that that won't be a hundred percent strength training right, right. to get your physique in check. Right. But also you as a client need to be realistic with where you're at in life. Right. Nutrition, lifestyle, and habits, how much yeah, and how things. much how much you know, time and effort can yep. you put into nu- nutrition? And you know, I, I think it's important that we that we're careful to not promote body dysmorphia, that we promote, you know, self image issues based right. on what people perceive they should look like or have to look like or you know, there are all sorts of different body types and, and, uh, people have to be aware that, you know, if you've got an, a naturally ectomorphic build that you've got a particular body type, if you've right. got an endomorphic build, mesomorph, you know, all those different body types. And so what we also don't want to do is pigeonhole people into what our own perception of what they should look like and maybe shape their perception of what their realistic expectations are. If a woman's got a really wide pelvic girth, and her greater trochanters of her hips or her femurs are 26 inches. You're not going, and there's very little body fat on the edge of her hips. You're not going to make her a 24 inch hip width. No, it's just not going to happen. No. She's um, going to look curvy. Right now, that wasn't the right number. Let's say 34 or 36. You know, yeah, hips yeah. wise, but that's more probably realistic. But so yeah, it's just not going to happen. So you, you have to be honest with clients too sometimes, and, you, and then you focus on the strengths. Not on their weaknesses, but focus on their strengths. And you can do other things to shape the body and to, you know, if a woman's got wider hips and she wants to look more symmetrical, build her shoulders, build her boulders. Right, right. And those are the things we're talking about. Exactly. It comes back to like our, our friend Santana has talked about on this podcast that, um, you know, you want to look, you want to get that V shape, that yeah. athletic V shape. Yeah. Hey, stop neglecting your deadlift. Right. You know, get exactly. your deadlift up. Yeah. You know, do yeah. your chin ups, um, yeah. that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And I, and I think a healthy body has a little fat too. So we, we, we could, Cover yeah. that some other time. All right, so let's talk about the press, guys. So All right, the rant press, over the press. The press um, is a great upper body lift. Trent and I have talked about the press several times in, in the sense that if we had one upper body lift, we could do whether it be bench press, the press, military press, seated, you know, or or where we could do incline press or all these different types of press. It would be the press, um, and there are several different variants of the press, but. The first of those, remember that the press basically is a front rack position barbell lift where the barbell starts right below the chin. The elbows are in front of the bar. We want to make sure that the elbows are in front of the bar to ensure that the rack position is correct. We want to drive that bar as close to our nose as we can and then up over the head, basically right at about the ear level, and then go into full lockout with the elbows and then get a big shrug or act like we're trying to punch the ceiling at the top of the motion. We're going to bring the bar right back down to the original starting position. There is no jump with that. There is no bounce necessarily with that. Other than there are variants to what we call the strict press, which is what I just um, described. Yeah. The strict press is a no bounce off the bottom, dead start, press from the bottom all the way up to the top into full lockout and shrug and back to the starting position That's right. at the rack. Strict press, no body English. Exactly. It's just strict, exactly like it says, okay? We could also call that the 1.0 press, as in starting strength. That's what they call it, is the 1.0 press, okay? The second press we could teach would be a variant of the strict press, and we call it the 1.5. Explain the 1.5. Yeah, so the 1.5, well... You know, it might actually make more sense to talk about the 2.0 and then talk about the 1.5 as the in-between. Yeah, so let's, yeah that's a let's, good point because that's kind of how we approach yeah, it. Yeah, so let's jump forward to the, the press 2.0. Um, this is a what, what used to be called the Olympic press, or it's a variation of the Olympic press, which if you go back to the, like the 60s layback, and 70s, kinda. you'll see these guys that will start from the rack position, thrust their hips forward, 
and then use that 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 kinetic energy built up from the forward thrust to drive the bar up overhead. Um, so we kind of do that in the press 2.0. We use a hip thrust at the start position, and then that hip thrust creates this tension through our torso, through our abdomen, our abs, hip flexors, our quads. And when we rebound off the front, in other words, we throw our hips forward, we build out that tension, and then we rebound back to neutral, we use that kinetic energy to drive the bar up overhead. Um, so it creates a little bounce. Yeah. yeah. Stretch reflex. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's like it's like um, a bow and arrow almost. That's right. We, 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 pull the, we push the bow forward and pull the string back, and then we release it. And that release is a little bit of inertia drive off the bottom to start the bar moving to the full lockout position overhead. That's right. And so anyone who's done a heavy strict press knows that the hardest thing is to get the thing moving in the first yeah. place, right? Yeah. Going from the bottom position to your eyebrows is really hard. So what that 2.0 does is it gives us that extra little bounce right, or kinetic right. energy to drive the bar up to our eyebrows. Then our triceps can take over and we can lock it out, right? Right, Which is very similar to the strict press at that point in the movement. So that's a really useful style of press for doing for lifting more weight, right? Because right. that's one of our criteria is we want to try to move as much weight as possible so we can use more muscle mass, right? Right. Advice, they go hand in hand. Yep. So we're using more muscle mass with that hip movement and we're moving more weight. Right. Then we have the, the 1.5. Right. So right. the 1.5 is simply the in-between. We're going to use a strict press or, well, you, actually you can do it either way. Yeah. If you could do it too, and that's the problem, is that some people can't, don't have the kinesthetic awareness or the hip mobility or whatever. They just, sometimes you just can't put it together, even as hard as we coach them sometimes. And so um, some people are motor morons too. That, yeah. Well, They're you know, to be fair, to, teach. to be fair, the press is a very technical exercise, yes. which we'll get into. The mechanics are brutal. If you yep. don't adhere to physics, it will. Yeah, the bar gets out of the bar path. Uh, the barbell lifter balance gets imbalanced. It will humble bar, you quickly. Yes, yes the Absolutely. bar won't go up or it'll go forward too far. But basically, if you can't do a 2.0 press, then we back you off. And what we do is we get you off the bottom first with the bar. And then when you get into the full lockout overhead, and if you could do kind of a modified 2.0 or kind of a bastardized 2.0 off yeah. the bottom, then if you can get into full lockout overhead, you rest at the top, take a breath in, tighten everything up, get your valve salva. And as you're coming down to the bottom, when you get to the very bottom of the press, just as the bar gets below your chin, there's a, a false bottom that you create with a bounce and you get hips forward, stretch reflex off the bottom, and bounce back up to the top. Now, you don't come off your feet. Your heels don't come off the floor. Everything stays grounded in the feet. Okay, It's not a jump. It's not a push press no. or a push jerk. It's a, it's a press, Okay, but the difference is instead of um, bouncing off the, the bottom at the start, you start at the top almost, and you come to the bottom, and you finish back at the top. That's right, yeah. So this is an easy way to think of this is simply a rebound press. Yes. Because we're focusing yeah. on the rebound after the first rep. Right. The first right. one, you just got to get up. And yeah, like to your point, there's lots of ways you can accomplish that first rep. Um, some people that are having trouble getting the timing of the hip thrust down in the 2.0, I'll say, hey, just strict press the first one. Yeah. And yeah. then rebound the rest of them. Right. Um, or they might do something simple like they won't actually thrust their hips explosively, they might just push their hips forward right. to get a little bit of tension back. and then throw the bar up right. more like a strict press somewhere in between. And right. then the following reps, two through five, they will do with the rebound. Right. right. So again, the whole point of this is you can use these different variations to increase the amount of weight that you can move because the strict press poses a, a big problem in just getting the weight moving off the bottom position. Right. Right. And there's a couple of key points when we talk about the press, whether we're talking about the, the 1, the 1 1.5, or the 2.0 press. And they, they, here, are, here are some of the points of performance in this lift. Um, number one, the grip width needs to be at a width that's basically at shoulder width. Your index finger is basically going to be directly in front of your shoulder so that when you put the bar in the rack position in front of you and the elbows are in front of the bar, okay, they're not directly beneath the bar, they're slightly in front. Your forearms should look vertical from the front. So I ought to be able to see that the grip is narrow enough, but not too wide, too narrow. We want it to be right where basically you create like 
two vertical lines to the floor, two perpendicular lines to the floor. That's right. Okay. And 99% of you, when you first try to press, will have your grip too wide. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Most people are surprised yeah. when they come in here. Yeah. And your elbows are in and your, and your wrists are out. That's right. That's yep. right. They're surprised it's at how like a narrow. W almost or a V. Yeah. You, uh, th- most people will have their index finger on the smooth part of the yep, bar. Right inside, inside the knurling. That's right. Inside yep. the, the knurling. Um, you have to be a fairly large guy to gri- to need to grip the bar on the knurling. Right, right. It, it, most people are going to grip it somewhere on the yep. smooth um, with their index finger kind of right where the smooth part meets yeah. the rough part. Yeah, the other thing is when you take your grip on the bar, the type of grip, and I used this term the other day with a couple of female clients. There were two sisters that the parents had brought them in for training, and I called it a crooked grip. I had a hard time getting them to do it, but I called it, put your hand crooked on the bar. And they're like, what do you mean? And they, I mean, they weren't like, what do you mean? I said, I said, here's what I mean by being crooked. And they were like, oh, that makes sense. So not straight on the bar like this, but crooked on the bar like this. And I was like, yeah, that's correct. Mm, so yeah. the, the grip that you take is going to be where the bar should come through the web space of your index finger and your thumb. And then it should strike across your palm following the mid palmer line to basically what we call your hypothenar eminence, which is the base of your pinky. The grip should not be up by your knuckles in your palm so that your wrist overextends. The grip should be where the bar is sitting between the thumb, the index finger, and then the bar should exit your palm, okay, on the pinky side, on the little finger side, down at the base of that finger, down near your wrist almost, not at your wrist, but but pretty right, close. Yeah, just distal, just away from your wrist, okay? And your wrist should be extended about 10 to 15, 10 to 20 degrees, and that's about it. That's right. Extended means coming backwards yeah, just, back, just a, a tiny, tiny bit. bit. Just a tiny bit. Now, also, some coaches will teach this same grip with the fingertips on the bar, okay, just on the bar, so as to ensure that the grip stays in that position. It helps to keep that bar in the right position and ensures that you're keeping that bar. It's very hard to extend backwards and not go ahead and just wrap your fingers around the bar. Right, right. Okay, so putting just the fingertips on the bar and putting the bar in the base of the index finger, web space, and thumb area, and then on the pinky helps to basically keep that stable wrist. Yeah, so that that's one of the things that I find people that are new to lifting have a lot of trouble with is understanding that they can they can control their wrists actively sure a lot of people their wrists are just kind of passively kind of hanging on for the ride right and one of the things we always see is that people will lower the press after their first rep they'll do the first rep great and then then when they come down from that first rep then the wrist back their wrists are way bent back yep okay so you so that that what Darren described as pinching the bar with your right. fingertips, right. that kind of that does two things. Number one is it locks that your wrist into that ten to fifteen degrees mm-hmm. of extension that we're looking right. for, ten to fifteen degrees of bent back. Yeah, um, and it also it it gives you a kind of a proprioceptive feedback. You can actually grip the bar, right, and then take active control of your wrists. They're not just flopping around, right, hanging out. Yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of CrossFit athletes, people that have, that have done cross CrossFit and have done like push press or, or strict press overhead or push jerks or any, or any lifting overhead, they, the bar is always usually back in the knuckle space. Right, right. right yeah, over you the see their wrists the way knuckles, bent back. And the wrists are way bent back, even on a press. And that's not healthy for your wrist. That's why your wrist ache. It makes the tendons ache. It just puts too much stress on some of the ligamentous structures too. So we want that bar down in the base of the palm. Yeah, and, and I think this is really important because um, we mentioned it before, physics in the press... Um, you have to adhere to. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, in a squat or a deadlift, you've got so much muscle mass. You can fudge it a little bit. Yeah, you can be a little <laughs> off. You know, your, yeah. your mechanics can be a little yeah. off and you can save the lift. With a press, if, if you're off, if, you're, if the bar moves half an inch outside of your midline, right. that vertical line right. on the way off, then you might miss that press. Right. So it, it, especially when it gets heavy, your technique matters a lot. And so these little details get amplified. And so one of those is is keeping the bar on the midline, just like we talked about right. with the squat. Right. If we draw a line up from the middle of our foot all the way up through our bodies, it will run right in front of our face. Right. And we want the bar to be moving over that midline the whole time. If your wrists are bent back, 
then you have two problems. Number one, the bar has fallen behind the midline right. to start with. So you've got a little moment arm you've got to overcome right from the beginning. Right. And number two, you're pushing on the bar with the bones of your forearm and all these this muscles that it's putting force in the bar, but that has to translate through your bent wrist. Right, right. Right? If you get that wrist locked in slight extension like we talked about, mm-hmm. now the wrist is out of the equation. We're just using the big, strong bones of the forearm and then the muscles of the shoulders and the triceps to push the bar. It's yeah, and I much think more the wrist can be a power leak, for lack of better terms, too. It yeah. can definitely be a power leak and a technique issue, but also wrist health. If you're, if you're a little bit older lifter like we are, then we want to make sure that we're using our joints in a near neutral position when we're loading in that manner. When we've got a joint that's not going to move a whole lot during a lift, and the wrist is one of them, um, it's kind of like your neck. The neck during the squat and the neck during your during the press even or the bench press, it's fairly in, it should be in somewhat of a neutral position in relationship to the rest of the spine. So we're setting it in an isometric contraction or stable position. All right. Same thing with your wrist. So so we got that, we've got that grip width, we've got the type of grip. Okay, and we've got um, to now talk about the bottom rack position. The bottom rack position is when you're in the bottom of the press. Okay, the bar is going to be just at your clavicle height. Okay, or maybe a little bit higher for most guys. Maybe yeah. a little, maybe, maybe right it, at for most women. Yeah, but but somewhere in between the bottom of your chin and your clavicles, right in there. The bar is floating right there. The elbows are directly in front. Okay, your forearms are vertical and perpendicular to the floor. You have a big chest, big lifted chest, raising the chest up and extending the thoracic spine. The upper back goes into extension. We want to present your chest upward towards the ceiling. Okay, that helps to recruit more of the chest. Okay, and tighten those lats. And then we're going to have the elbows, like we talked about, in front of the bar, not behind the bar. In other words, not on the body side, but away from the body side on the other side of the bar. They have to stay in that position. It's easier to hold the bar in that position, first of all. It shortens the lever arm between the bar and the lifter, but it also angles the forearms at an angle that's more upward and backward, which is where the drive of the force is going to be anyway, which is going to be up and back, okay? It's not going to be up. It's going to be up and back. Up and back. Okay? And so if the, if the elbows have dropped behind the bar towards the body, now the forearms are actually pushing forward, okay? Or if they're directly up, they're pressing, they're straight up and down, they're pressing straight upward. We want the bar to be driven up and back, okay? Yeah, and that's important because I actually, I, I told a little fib earlier. I said that if we drew that midline from our yeah, foot yeah, all the yeah, way yeah, up yeah, to our body, yeah. I said it would run right in front of your face. That's actually not true. If you're standing up straight, it would run up through your chin. Yep, yep. Up through, through the bottom of your chin. Yeah, that's right. So um, if we go back to that press 2.0, where we use a hip right, drive, right, right. part of what that hip drive accomplishes for us is it makes our chin move backwards, our right. face move backwards. Clears the bar path. Which clears the bar so it can move exactly on the midline. Yes. Yes. Which otherwise, if we were doing a strict press, that would actually, we, we can't move the bar through our right. face, right? right. And so that's part of the reason the elbows have to be forward, like you said, right. is so that we get it over the actual midline, which is behind the face if right. you're standing up right. straight. And when we're then so so when we take the bar from that position in the bottom rack position or in the rack position, now if we're going to do the let's say we're going to do the 2.0 press, so we're going to use hip drive, we're going to send the hips forward. Okay, we're going to send the hips forward, and we actually extend the hip joint, okay? We're going to rest on those ligaments of the hip joint and the big hip flexors and the big mass muscles of the front of the hip, okay? Um, The rectus femoris, which is a two-joint muscle that crosses the hip, and it also crosses the knee joint, okay? The rectus femoris is one of your quads, and we're going to bounce off those muscles. So we send the hips forward and then back, forward and then back. That forward drive actually drops the bar just a little bit. It gets a little bit of a stretch reflex, but you've got to stay tight. You got to squeeze those elbows in, vertical forearms, big chest, okay, and and create almost an area in between your lats and your armpit where you couldn't slide a credit card through there if you right, tried right. to for the for your life for the life of you. 
I'll often cue uh, people tight armpits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep your armpits tight. And I'll, I'll go up behind them, see if I can slide my index finger up into their armpits, you yeah. know, and get up behind them, see if I, if there's tightness there, then that basically creates a scenario where we don't have power leaks, where, where we're not going to be moving around all over the place. We want their core to be tight or their trunk musculature. They get that valve salva. They send the hip forward. And as the hip returns, the bar is driven down and then up and back into full lockout overhead. And at the very top of the press overhead, when the elbows are locked out, the shoulders are in full flexion overhead. That's not extension, that's flexion. But when everything's up overhead, they're going to shrug towards the ceiling by recruiting their upper traps and raising the shoulder blades and the fist up towards the ceiling. I tell them, punch the ceiling. That's right. Yeah. Is what I tell them. That's right. And that works really well. Um, The return on the press is just the opposite. We come down to the bottom, rack position, we reset, breathe out, take a breath in and do it again. Yeah. Okay. and, And here's the thing, you know, pay attention to the down part of the press. A lot of people focus oh, everything absolutely. on getting it up, and they're like, okay, great. And then they just let it flop back down. And then they, when they bring it back down... The elbows are behind them. That's right. Elbows are too low. The wrists are bent back. Everything's loose, right? Right. So imagine that. I think the best way to um, to get your rack position, the bottom position correct on the way down, is to imagine that midline, and you're going to slide that bar back down your face, that midline, yep, yep. while the elbows go forward. So you're thinking all these things, elbows forward, straight wrists. Elbows forward, elbows forward, elbows forward. There we That's go. I tell them. And that way, yeah. when you come back down, you're already in the right spot. Right. It's very, very difficult on a press, especially when it gets heavy, to to bring it down in the wrong position and then try to get it back up into position. Right. A lot of times it's a lot it's just, of wasted energy. It's a lot of wasted energy. A lot of times it's just not going to happen. Yeah, and it takes almost some pure strength down at the bottom there to get those elbows back forward and, and right. it's just it also gets you out of the timing and rhythm of the press. It ought to be it ought to be, you know, hip drive forward, press to the top, lock out, back down to the bottom, breath out, breathe back in, big valve salva, hip drive forward press out to the top and there's a rhythm of the lift That's you know right. yeah i find that the longer i hold that that bar in the bottom rack position the harder the press gets yes <laughs> i want to get those reps done i don't want to do them holy gully or, or speed base but but i want to have a reasonable timing in between reps that's and right. that's what i tell people a lot of times with the squat i'll have lifters that spend you know 30 seconds standing in between reps i'm like go 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 yeah, go <laughs> you're holding that weight right you know get the rep set done but um that's the press. Those are the those are the basics of the press in the way that we teach it as barbell coaches, and we learn that methodology through starting strength. That's right, and yeah. that's how we teach it. And it's it's good physics, it's good human mechanics, and it's healthy and safe. Um, one of the things that older lifters always ask me about, and they seem to have a problem with, you know, I got a rotator cuff problem, mm, or right. my doctor said not to lift overhead anymore, and and I don't find that to be the case with clients as long as the press is taught correctly and adhered to with proper form. If the press, along with the bench press too, are done incorrectly, they're hard lifts and they can hurt your shoulders. And so you've got to be doing the press correctly. And if you are a lifter out there that needs modifications on the front end, your coach can modify the press on the in the start of your training and gradually progress you to a normal press setting, okay? But sometimes we have to do some modifications. Sometimes we, we, we expect that you're not going to have as much mobility as you need. So maybe the bar's a little forward. So we're going to decrease the load progression maybe. We're going to work on some other mobility things. The good thing is that if you're low bar squatting or if you're squatting like we call it, then you are building your shoulder mobility. We might do a a bar stretch, get you into the rack position, have you do that too right. on a daily basis and work on some mobility for those shoulders. But everyone, no matter what your age is, if you have you know, reasonable, reasonable health in your shoulders and even bad shoulders can start pressing and gradually progress in load and do really well and build some upper body strength overhead. That's right. Yeah. I had a client recently who received some feedback from, a, from another um, healthcare person professional that they should not press overhead oh and, always and the never. reason and the yes. reasoning oh, no, given never press. the reasoning given uh given was that uh, they only had about i'd say 170 degrees of shoulder flexion so in other words if they raised their arms overhead 
then they wouldn't get all the way to where their arms are pointing straight up to the sky. They were kind of pointing forward a little bit, about 10 degrees forward. Well, I'll and, just tell you this, that that a handful of, you know, I don't know what the percentage would be, but I would say 25 to 50% of men over the age of 40 to 45 can't do that. And over the age of 50, it probably increases. That's right. And this was, a, we just, we just lose joint mobility eventually. That's right. Yeah. You know, this was an older gentleman. He right, had some right. ar- arthritis as well. Right. He's an arthritis medication. So yeah, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on with these joints. Right. They get beat up over time. And so, you know, he, he thought that, well, I can't press. Right. And that's, exactly. that's was, oh, yeah. that was his thought up front. And I said, well, let's just try. We can only start with the lightweight and progress. Just let's just see where we get. And um, he's been able to regularly increase his press for, gosh, almost three months now. Absolutely. And has um, has hit some very you know reasonably heavy weights. We he probably cannot go maximally heavy with his press right, because right. when he locks the bar out, the bar is forward. It's about an inch forward yeah. of his midline. It's heavy. Right? The physics are are going to pull him forward yeah, at the top, exactly. and that's okay. It's been a great way to augment his bench press training where he's got a, right. he's got more range of motion and, and mobility so he can go heavy on the bench press and the, but the pressing is kind of keeping his shoulders healthy in that they're, he's working the full shoulder girdle, all the musculature of the Absolutely. shoulder and so keep it in context you know not everybody is going to have um, the range of motion to press you know huge weights like yeah, you see the yeah. old guys from the 70s yeah. doing and that's okay it's still the most important part of your upper body program. Yeah, and I'll tell you, as a little bit older guy, I'm 52, and and uh, I am, um, you know, I'm not crazy old, but I'm not crazy young anymore either. And and so, out of all my lifts, the press will take the biggest hit if I detrain or deload or I'm out on vacation or sick or whatever else, and that's just natural. But I found with my older client population that the press it lift is the greatest lift to suffer because it's got smaller muscle mass recruitment. Right. Um, you're dealing with smaller muscle bellies to start with, and and men's shoulders and women's also over time just get weak. And so building that strength overhead with the proper form and the proper programming and the right technique is possible. And then we have some workarounds that we can do if needed, but there's always a place to start. And then we just let it roll, you know? And so, like you said, I mean, at least this guy basically is putting weight over his head that he never thought he would put over his head. And whether he ever gets much stronger than that, he's better off than he was before. That's right. And so he's actually lifting some loads now and getting the weight overhead and performing um, upper body lifting with with a lift that we kind of consider the mother, The it's not the mother, we'll call it the father of all upper body lifts. And that is the strict press or the press. And again, to our point, just like the squat, when you have that bar overhead, right? We're, we're, we're talking about the compound lifts here, right? Right, right, right. When you, when you lock that bar out overhead, you've got the whole body in compression supporting that bar. So it's a whole body lift. Yeah, absolutely. Even though it's primarily an upper body lift, we're loading the whole body and it requires a lot of balance to hold that bar at the very top with weight on it. It's a very long range of motion, long kinetic chain. So yeah. it's fulfilling our criteria of being an excellent compound lift. Right. The, the right. bench press is great because the bench press, we can handle very heavy weights. Right. But the kinetic chain, the, the range of motion is not nearly as long. Right. So it doesn't train the body quite as well, the, the whole body quite as well as the press does. And from a practicality standpoint, too, it's not as functional, 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 functional. Oh, there was some echoing there in the room. As the presses because the press really does um, mirror human life when you go outside and you lift something to, up into a shelf or you reach overhead to get something or you reach up into a cupboard or you know a cabinet or you um, you go to lift something let's say out at your ranch like I do and I want to put a bag of feed up overhead or or lift something up higher then it's something that you can actually experience and use in your day-to-day life yeah now it's not that the bench press doesn't bring value it's just that pushing, you could lock your hands right in front of your chest and use your hips and legs. Right. And as long right. as you can lock in there, you're pretty good to go. I, I'm but, waiting for the day that something around the house that's real heavy needs to be moved. And I, I could say like, yeah. get under it and the floor press it away. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. You know, <laughs> it's, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm no. waiting. Well, if a car fell on your chest, you might need to be able to bench press it off. That's right. Or yeah, just, you might want to call Jordan out into the garage and ask her to deadlift it off of you even that's, better. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but I, we love the press. Um, I think every person over the age of 40 with 
with um, even with bad shoulder health, this there are very few people that I have had as clients or patients that I can't get them to press more weight with less pain and more function and more ability long term than they had before. So I would say if you're not pressing and you're over the age of 40 and you're a male or female, you should be. You should be using the press as the father of the upper body lifts. That's right. So before we check out here, um, I want to talk to, I want to address the ladies, all the ladies in the house. When we talk about programming the press, you know, we talked about that the press is very sensitive to uh, muscle mass and detraining. And it's one of the first things. In fact, you said, you know, we've got smaller muscle groups that right. are moving. Small the muscle bellies. and Muscle bellies uh, moving. Yeah. We see this even with people that lose significant amounts of weight. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, during sure. the training process, their press sometimes gets impacted because yeah. as they get smaller as a person, there's just less mass around that joint to right. help move the bar. Right. Well, ladies don't have as much muscle mass as, as guys do. Right. right. That's part of the deal. And that means that you may not be able to make progress at the same rate the guys can. Well, you won't be. You, you, you won't simply be won't be. Yeah. And um, in, th- in fact, that might happen rather quickly in your right. training program, right. and that's perfectly fine. So um, we always start with kind of a, a blanket, increase each lift by five right. pounds per workout. That's, five that's to 10 pounds five based to 10 on pounds. the lift. Yeah. That's right. Based on the lift. That might be appropriate for you ladies for the first couple workouts, but right. very quickly you might need to go to a two and a half pounds right. per workout. And then not long after that, one pound per right. workout. Right. And then even maybe a half pound. And right. that's, um, that's perfectly okay. Don't get, if you feel like you're getting stuck with your press progression, number one, make sure that you're paying attention to those details we talked about earlier. Right. Techniques got to be on point. Right. But number two, don't be afraid to slow down your progression. And if you find yourself stuck, deload a little bit, right. maybe lower your weight down 10% and then build back up right. with a slower progression. Two and a half pound jumps, one pound jumps, half pound jumps. Um, because you just got to realize that you don't have as much muscle mass right. to adapt. Yeah. And I think, and we're going to, we talked about this last, last um, podcast that um, we're going to cover some basic programming principles after we finish the compound lifts on, on how we would program this with the novice. What, what's a normal novice program look like in the barbell lifts and, and little tweaks and things that we do along the way that are taught either in the starting strength world or in practical programming or with other organizations like barbell logic and, and several other organizations that are out there that teach um, a very similar barbell methodology and the programming methodology. I mean, even even some of the barbell medicine stuff is very similar. That's right. And so yeah. there's lots of little tricks to get the press moving yes. after you hit that first wall. So, yeah, and there's yeah, and there's we'll some things that. that we've learned as coaches from an experience basis where we naturally would take a female lifter in in the following steps and progressions because right. we just found that this works better. That's right. And so we just automatically do it. And it's the same with male lifters and age plays a big role in that. Previous training career or training history plays a role in that. What, what the size of the lifter is like, all those things make a difference in regards to, and that's the experience you get when you pay for a coach too. That's right. Is that you, you get that insight to where you're going to basically avoid a lot of the pitfalls as a lifter or as someone who's trying to get strong. Um, and so you're going to get a better return on your investment than you would if you trained on your own. Eventually you'll get it figured out and you'll do it yourself. But even us as coaches, we um, um, consistently have each other look at each other's lifts we have outside coaches look at what we're doing, look at our programming, et cetera, et cetera. So no one is above the law. That didn't make any sense. Or the top like of the press. Exactly. Exactly. Because that would be impossible. Right. Everyone needs coaching, period. Everyone needs a little coaching every now and then. Yeah. So, hey, guys, thanks for joining us today and to talk about the press. You can reach out to us, uh, you know, on the social media platforms, 40 Fit Nation on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram at 40 Fit Radio. We're working on another application that we might launch here soon that will allow you as the 40 Fit Nation audience to come into a private scenario or a private setting with us and communicate with other lifters, other people that are trying to get fit and healthy like you are, and also us, the coaches. And so we're working on that right now, and that should be rolling out here soon. We'll tell you more about it in upcoming episodes. You can also find us, Trent at Marmalade Cream, on Instagram, myself at Dr. Deaton, and then you can email us info at 40 Fit Radio. Man, we loved having you guys today. Get out there and press some weight and don't neglect your upper body because you don't want to look like a Trinosaurus Rex. That's right. Remember, curls for the girls. Yes. Presses for the dresses.
Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. See ya.